suggest we vote no, and then let them, if they want to put them out next year and let them be vetted through the resolution committee that they have with NISBA, so be it. I, how do they even come through without being vetted? How do you get a late submission? I've never seen that before. Do you? I agree, I've never seen that before, that they've allowed them through. Yeah. I don't remember the process. One year, Amherst did submit a resolution to Dr. Lane Spearman uh, many years ago. But there's a specific timeline, and I know that I right. share that with everyone. And Well, but they do let you bring new ones up at the meeting. So oh, this could be a step in the right direction as far as at least giving you before somebody gets up at the microphone. So I think that's the only thing they're offering here is, you know? Well, and that may be true because it is virtual. Yeah, um, yeah. the vote is virtual, so that could be one of the So I agree with Paul. Yeah. Uh, they can bring it back next year if they're struggling on the is everybody good with that suggestion? Yep. All right, you have your orders then, uh, Mark? Perfect. No other committee reports? If I get, uh, I just um, sure. clarify. So from 18 to 25, they are recommending that we vote no, and we are agreeing that they are voting no. Right? Correct. So make that clear. We're okay. agreeing with their recommendations other than 12 Perfect. and 15. Thank you. Yeah, they were pretty innocuous, though. I don't feel like they changed the um, intent. They just clarified the new intent. All right. With that, we'll turn over to the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, first, we got we have is our external auditor's report. Um, so our representatives from President Malecki are here to join us to review our annual financial report. Welcome. Thank you. Alright. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Carl Lindner. I've been the engagement partner uh, from Joshua Malecki on your audit for the past few years. And with me tonight is Charles Chaudier. He is the senior manager on the audit job. So he did uh, you know, a little bit more of the grunt work and is more familiar with uh, the actual testing and individual making sure the supervision of the staff on site and facilitating the field work. Um, so we're here tonight to present on the results of our audit of the district's fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021. Um, the audit was conducted primarily in August and finishing up the field work and then the last month we spent working with management back and forth on putting together the draft financial statements. So tonight, we put together a presentation similar to past years just to help facilitate a walkthrough of both the audit process as well as some of the high level financial highlights of the general fund of the district, which represents the lion's share of the activity. So first off, just to re-familiarize the group with what we provide at the end of each year. First off, of course, the basic financial statements. So management, the treasurer, school business the official, they're in charge of the staff who maintain all the accounting transactions throughout the year in their general ledger. And they compile all of those annual information, financial information, into financial statements. And then our job as your external auditors is to come in and assess risk, design tests, to gain assurance that the amounts that are maintained by district management are fairly stated and that they accurately represent the district balances at June 30th and also the revenue and expenditure activity for the 12 months thereof. That said, that's in the basic financial statements, that's the main document. At the back of that document, there's another separate audit that's specific to the federal awards of the district. And that's what we refer to as a single audit. And in that case, we act essentially as an extension of the federal government, and we perform a compliance audit 
over the federal programs at the district under their compliance standards. It's called the Uniform Guidance. So we also perform that service for the district as well. Also in the package are a management letter and an auditor's communication letter. The management letter is basically our forum to provide any best practices or if we had any deficiencies that we noted in internal control that we thought could use some improvement, that's the letter that will put those recommendations in. Auditor communications basically reiterates the terms of the contract. If you want to say, what's our responsibility at Dresden Hawaii? And then what is the district's responsibility in order for the audit to go through effectively? Um, so that, that letter just reiterates that both sides held up their end of the deal. And the last piece is an extra classroom activity report. That's actually a separate, smaller financial statement. That's on a cash basis, and that outlines all the activity of the student clubs and activities that are run throughout the year. So coming up, we just have a few slides. Like I said, similar to last year, uh, with some financial highlights, and Charles will run you through those. Thank you, Carl. Good evening. Uh, as I go through financial highlights, as Carl mentioned, we'd like to focus on the general fund, which oversees a uh, $64 million budget. And as you can see on this chart here, we'd like to show this, it paints a picture of how your general fund has fared or trended over the last five years. It shows the blue line, which represents your revenue, the amount you raise your budget, and it shows the red line, which is your expenditures and your level of service that you offer uh, students. And obviously every year the goal is to keep the, the, the blue line revenues and your expenditures as close to one another to match the budget that's adopted. And as you can see, the first three years in that chart here, 17 all the way to 2018, 2019, uh, district did a really good job in um, budgeting and making sure that the, the level of revenues and spending stayed close to one another, going up one year and staying consistent. Now this paints a great picture of what happened with the pandemic starting in 2019, 2020, uh, where uh, a lot of uncertainty existed, and uh, the district elected to stay cautious, save the future without knowing is federal aid going to dry up, dry up, state aid going to dry, what's going to happen with inflation, uh, pandemic costs, uh, level of enrollment. So obviously, uh, the red line decreased a little bit in, in controlling costs last year, 2019-2020. Now this year, 2020-2021, the district RC planned to uh, catch up on that spending, and they did with, with uh, the red line uh, increasing. And the actual increase in the red line, the expenditures this year, is $5 million. That $5 million is roughly $1.7 million in instructional costs, $1.4 million in employee benefits, which both are standard with increases over the last several years. And the other component of $5 million spending is $1.34 million in um, debt service costs. There was a large bond that was issued last year to finance capital project, $25 million bond. I see this year was the first principal payment due. So that caused expenditures to go up by $5 million, which was planned for. Revenue stayed consistent, uh, only a $500,000 increase. That increase was helped with $800,000 of new federal aid, CARES Act money, that helped run some of the programs. And, uh, I like to point out sales tax. Sales tax did go up $200,000. $200, and if we were to talk about where sales tax would have ended up last year at this time, I bet a lot of us would have expected a decrease. So it actually increased by $200,000. $200, so the net difference between the red line, your expenditures, and your revenues this year is $1.2 million that the district used fund balance. Um, and that was actually planned for in the budget. Um, with the district planning to use $1 million. So how does this $1.2 million use of fund balance affect total fund balances? This chart here shows uh, total fund balances, which is split out into two components, what we consider to be restricted, legal reserves adopted by this body, um, and an unrestricted portion, which is available for use um, at the district's discretion. So 2019-2020, the higher column here um, shows total fund balance of $11 million last year. Obviously it went up by $3.2 million with the savings that occurred last year with COVID. This year, total fund balance dropped to about $9.8 million. As I said, the district used $1.2 million this year, which correlates to um, a decrease to $9 million at 2020-2021. 
Now, this slide here shows uh, as a requirement for us to communicate and to test for compliance. The district, all districts are restricted by uh, real property tax law, section 1318, to ensure that they keep fund balance, unassigned fund balance level of at most 4% of next year's spending, which is the $64 million budget. Um, as you see, the second column from the right, last year with COVID, the pandemic, uh, the district elected to exceed the 4%. Now what that means is management has to come up with a plan of why they elected to do so. They were transparent in it. They communicated the plan in the state uh, due to the uncertainty, what's gonna happen in the future. Um, they elected to keep all the savings that they generated last year into an assigned fund balance to be available for use. This year, um, as you see, unassigned fund balance went from $5.5 million to $4.3 million. Once again, that's that $1.2 million use of fund balance this year. So they plan on um, all their use this year of fund balance was basically reducing unassigned fund balance to get to the, get back to that compliance of 4%. But once again, there's still uncertainty out there and the district is transparent into uh, ensuring that um, they still have a plan with New York State to, to say that we don't know what's going to happen, but every year we're going to plan on using fund balance to make sure we reduce it to 4%. So this year, similar to last year, and I don't think this is coming as a surprise to this group, I'm sure the school business official has made it apparent that the 4% is going to be exceeded. Um, that's sort of you know, the position that Amherst District is taking, and you do have you know, the proof to show that you did make an effort to spend it down, not holding it, uh, you know, stored away, so to speak. Um, it is coming back down, but at 6.6% is what will be reported in the financial statements this year as, as the compliance finding as it relates to the real property tax law. So overall observations, um, we look not only just at the numbers, but also at the policies and the procedures that affect all the numbers in those financial statements, and those are called your internal controls. So as it relates to internal controls, there were no reportable findings, and also, as I mentioned, that federal single audit that we performed, the compliance audit, there are no reportable compliance findings as it relates to that. So a, a clean report card when we look at both of those aspects. We are prepared, we're in a basically a final draft form. We're going back and forth on a few items with management in the draft financial statements and then we'll, we'll move forward with making sure we issue by that October 15th deadline. Um, but we're prepared to issue what's called an unmodified opinion and that's a clean opinion, the highest level that, that you would strive for and what, what you want. So we were able to meet with the audit committee a couple weeks ago to go over draft amounts and discuss all of our observations in a little bit more detail. And I just wanted to make sure I informed the whole group tonight. We did talk about a change that the district was required to make, and it's strictly really in the financial statements. It's not a real general fund or fund balance issue, but the district is subject to governmental accounting standards or, or GASB. And GASB statement number 84 was required to be implemented this year for the financials. And we helped make sure the district complies with those requirements in their financial statements. And this year I just want to update the board and let you know it did take a great deal of effort and time and commitment from your staff. So I wanted to pay some compliments to the treasurer and her staff, as well as the school business official. Um, they worked back and forth, specifically with Charles the most in our office, to make sure that all those requirements were, were implemented for this year's financial statement. So I just didn't want it to go unrecognized. That's about it. We'll be looking to wrap up final drafts, probably circulate those, um, and look to issue next week. But we're here tonight. We do have our contact information is on this last slide, so feel free to reach out if anything does come up. Uh, but if there are any questions tonight, we'd be happy to, to answer them. All right. Look that way, so. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
was on the elementary curriculum work that was done over the summer will be done into the school year and I think you'll see in a minute that it's been done over multiple years. It's multi-layered. So I want to start with this image because I'm thinking of you as the audience and I'm wondering, well, we've heard about phonics first before. We've heard about Amplify before. So the committee work that's being done is sustained. So effective professional development or curriculum writing has to be teacher-driven, sustained over time, highly engaging. It has to have aspects that can be implemented immediately into the classroom so that they can practice. So the reason I'm bringing this up is the work that we do with these curriculum committees at the elementary and secondary level are made up of all these components. And that's why Amherst is highly successful that when we adopt an initiative, it actually gets followed through and you can see like you can see it evident over time, which is really important because schools can change initi initiatives quickly. So phonics first is something that I shared with you a couple weeks ago. And this is something the ELA committee has been working on over time. And just to share with you the components that you saw on the second slide, we started out, and I'm going to say this briefly because I shared it a little bit, is that 20, summer of 20, going into 21, we did um, pilot one, which was one teacher, one special education teacher in a co-taught classroom. They decided, and they came to uh, Dr. Otto and I, and they said, we really feel like the word recognition instruction can be a little bit more explicit and a little bit stronger. And I said, interesting, because the data says that too. So let's let's try it. So that was pilot one. It then merged into pilot two because it was highly successful. We watched it, we looked at students' growth, we looked at implementation, how does it fit with all of our other programming, which is a problem when you bring in something new. How does it fit with the current practices that we don't want to lose a majority of those? So we did that, and then we had pilot two, which was our nine teachers, one from every grade level that piloted, and I kind of spoke with you about that two weeks ago a little bit, which led us to this year, which was full implementation. So why do I repeat and share this with you again? Once again, this is sustainable over time, and if I share with you, the committee members, it's teacher driven. And so it's beyond the people on the screen that have worked on this. So this is multi-layered, multi-yeared work that is um, having some good traction for us. So what tonight, how do I show you a little bit more about where we are in this multi-year um, endeavor is I'd like to take you in the classrooms. So thankfully, Lori Sasenko helped me, and the teachers helped us grab some video footage so that you could actually see the first year of implementation. So I'm gonna start off with K. And then we're going to move to one and two. And there's a couple things you have to, I want you to like think about when you're watching the video. Because the video is like a text. Like what are we rooting for right now? Notice this, it is explicit. Notice that it's multi-sensory and notice that it's embodied. So multi-sensory, kids will be touching sand, they'll be touching rice, they'll be having bean bags that they're using and manipulating along with words and sounds. The brain is attached to a body. We don't send the child's head to school, we send the whole body. So what we're trying to do is engage the body, it will increase retention and learning for students. We know that. You'll also see a little bit of, um, you'll hear about red bumpy paper. So when the kids write on it, they can feel it. And that feeling, that multi-sensory approach, also is another input method for um, students to retain. So as you're watching, look for that a little bit through these different videos and see how it changes. Molly and Lindsay are going to start us off with a little bit of discussion from Jamie and you'll see, take a peek inside their classrooms. At a kindergarten level this is. Shut 
todas as crianças com o tema de Covid, elas são impactos para as crianças que eu saw em kindergartners, com regards to isolating letter sounds e their ability to blend the sounds together to make words. The next clip you're going to see is our class reviewing the two part drill, which is part of the class for the program. Every day we work on kids working out a specific sound in a visual way, an auditory way, and then also a blended way. Since it's just the beginning of kindergarten, we're doing a two part drill where they are just working on seeing it visually and also listening for the sound. You will see an incorporation of sand trays, which is a multi sensory approach. This just allows the students to be actively engaged and also work on their skills. Thanks, Ah! So you're going to listen to myself. So give it a tiny shake. Give it a little bit of a 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 this progression. Thank <laughs> you. 
activity, so they're actually going to pretend they're and the elephant, and they're going to be skipping up words that have the F sound in them. And then they practice them by writing, we eventually dictate a word, and then sentences. So they apply some of the other skills they learned in previous days. Instruction that 
this is the standard focus that is primarily on the mother. Um, I guess this is going to be engaged in real world scientific practices, making them the scientists, making them the researchers, making them the um, ones that are actually cultivating and understanding and creating those public spaces and evidence. And in Italian, I'm a fourth grade inclusion teacher here at Smallwood. Amplified gave me writing opportunities that my kids did not normally see. I've been able to see and implement Amplified firsthand in grades 1, 2, and 4, and the same thing is happening in tree level. Kids who struggle with responding to tests were able to find success in an increased engagement of writing because Amplified gave these opportunities for written responses and areas that were not typically seen in their school day. My kids enjoyed being able to write about their own scientific process as they work through the units. Particularly for my fourth graders, I could see the carryover into the ELA responses on found claims and evidence from responding to attacks.
Um, I'm going to give you a teaser with the elementary math committee. It's a little bit brief because the work that we're doing with them is, a, is at a starting point. So thankfully, um, we now have um, interventionists in K1 and 2, which we have not only had. And that's really important, one, because of the year and a half that we're coming out of, but also, if we wait to intervene until kids are in third grade, the gaps are already there. So now I'm trying to recover multiple years worth of gaps. So one of the things that our committee is working with Dr. Norma Linataki from Buffalo State College, who works with math instruction, she's phenomenal. And um, this summer, the math committee got together with the math AIS teachers, and they determined big ideas that were non-negotiable concepts that kids have to learn by the end of K, one, and two. And actually, they pushed Nirmala, they're now moving to third, um, third grade as well, because they really wanted two, three together conceptually. So the big ideas are identified, they're defined, and now they have suggested materials. That is not specific enough for us to actually intervene and um, be able to help kids where they're at. So what we're doing is every month, Nirmala comes in and she meets with K1 and 2 interventionists. They look at the big concepts that need to be taught and they're developing multiple interventions and progress monitoring tools to follow kids' growth. The goal is to get them in, intervene, and get them out. Get them back into, I showed you the pyramid with tier one, Mike and Maria have brought up, brought up with MTSS. We want them in tier one. We don't want them by first in intervention. So can we have a targeted concept skill strategy we want to focus on? Interventions, multiple ones, because we don't know how students are going to respond to each intervention. Everybody learns differently. And then find a way to figure out if it's working. Are we teaching the kids the way they learn? And then if we are, they should be exiting out after X amount of weeks and getting them caught up. So this, we're very fortunate that the board, you know, approved these positions and we have these extra AIS positions and we really feel like we can um, increase student learning and we can be successful um, in have students coming to third grade without those gaps. So more to come on them. Um, they're work in progress right now and by next year they should have um, some good information to report to you. So I'm going to stop there. If there's any questions on mine specific, and then I'm going to introduce Amy real quick. I know you've heard a lot from me Okay, so I'm excited, but I'm going to, um, Amy is going to talk. We've spoken with you about learning gaps um, and, uh, and increasing student learning, and we yeah. have shared with you about summer school before. So, <laughs> again in another year that's like no other that we've had. So I want you to just take a second and look at this um, little graphic that was on social media, so you may have seen it, but take a minute to, to kind of ground us on where we're at. So I think the first one that stuck out to me, maybe because it's right on top, is those seventh graders at Amherst Middle School. I haven't had a normal year since fourth grade in our elementary building, right? My oldest son's in fourth grade, hasn't had a normal year since first grade. And our primary students never had a normal year in school, right? Probably affected their UPK or their pre-K. Probably affected their pre-K-3 program. So it really grounded our teachers and our building and what we're dealing with right now. And really what we're dealing with is interrupted school. 
right? We talked a little bit, a lot of you here, we have um, students who move from other countries, right? And maybe they've had interrupted school. But we might call them a site student, right? A student with interrupted formal education. And I'm almost wrapping my head around this year is all of our students have had interrupted formal education. This interrupted school. And what we know about interventions, kind of like Dr. Shannon just talked about, we know that we can intervene our way out of a 20% risk level. So when we have 20% of our students at risk, we can use tier two, tier three interventions, and we can, what we say, intervene our way out of that. Unfortunately, this global pandemic has created a tier one problem. Right? Our risk levels are higher than 20% because of what you just saw, right? And this interrupted schooling. So we have, we have a tier one problem that we cannot intervene our way out of. So this is the message that I shared with all of our teachers when I met with grade levels this week. Let me tell you, if I've ever been impressed with Amherst teachers, which I have since I've been here, through the roof, my level of respect for these professionals that we work with, is just incredible. We sat together as grade level teams. I shared that exact information, and what we saw was this attitude of every kid here in our school is our student. Not all they're struggling, they're yours. You provide the intervention. It's what can we do, all of us, to support all of our students. It was incredible. I even talked to Mr. Pinella on Friday. I was like, my assistant principal cup is so full. Like today was amazing. The conversations that we got to have about teaching and learning and about our kids. So they were collaborative. We sat kind of like this around a room facing each other. We're able to collaborate and problem solve. They were so positive. The level of concern was, was there because our risk level is there, but it was appropriate for the, um, the setting. It was so professional and extremely productive. So really, the enthusiasm and the momentum of the teaching and learning here at Amherst was back. And this MTSS process is back. So what I want to go over is just what is MTSS, right? What's an overview? Um, what do the meetings look like, sound like, and feel like? And then how are we actually bridging these gaps? So MTSS, Dr. Shanahan kind of touched on this, right? We have these three tiers. I know this slide is a little busy, but it's important. With MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support, used to be called response to intervention, or RTI, we have two sides of the triangle. So we have a social, emotional, and behavioral side, and an academic side, right? And this is a framework for which we use data to make decisions and to problem solve. So every kid, every decision that's made kind of goes through this pyramid. I was doing this a lot the last couple days. Looks like a volcano, but uh, it's just going through that pyramid. So tier one are the interventions every child gets. On the academic side, it's our good, high quality core instruction. It's high quality differentiation. On the um, social, emotional, behavior side, at small, what it's paused. At wind and merits responsive classroom. It's our strong classroom management. But then as we move up the pyramid, we have students who don't respond to that tier, right? So we have to intensify our interventions. So maybe on the social emotional behavior side, it's a small group counseling group, right? Or it's a homeschool communication notebook, or an in-class behavior plan. And on the academic side, maybe it's a small group um, reading intervention. Then again, we have some of those students who don't respond to that intervention either. Then we go up to tier three and it's much more intensive. Maybe a one-on-one -on -one reading intervention, maybe a one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling session. So this MTSS process started actually my first year at Windermere. In 1920, Dr. Shanahan got both elementary schools um, together, actually committees together, and we worked with Teresa Jandik, Dr. Jandik from Buffalo State. So she worked with us to really align and enhance our current practices. Both schools were already looking at data, right? <laughs> that wasn't a new process. But the way in which the meetings were run and the way in which decisions were made, some of those um, were tweaked and enhanced. So then we had our first meeting cycle that I'm going to explain in like the winter of 2020, just before we shut down. So like end of January, early February of 2020. So then last year was really our COVID year. We completed pre-assessments in every student. We completed post-assessments in every student. But we didn't have our normal data cycles for a multitude of reasons. So now, like I said, the momentum's back. Like we're back on track. 
can't tell you how many teachers were like, oh, I just can't wait to pick that baton back up. Like we had so much momentum in 1920 and now we finally get back together um, to do that work. So what is this cycle? Well, you'll see we do it three times a year. Starts with benchmarking. Then we have building level data meetings, grade level data meetings, and then progress monitoring, which leads us into the next cycle in the winter. Same four steps to the next cycle in the spring. So what do we mean by benchmarking? Well, we are screening assessments that every single student, tier one, take. So they are given three times a year by our school-wide assessment team. So that's really made up of our interventionists, our school psychologists, um, our enrichment, uh, gifted and talented teacher. And what we do is we meet before each benchmark, and um, they're a fantastic team at both benchmarks, and we do some like inter rater reliability protocols, so we're sure that when we administer these assessments, they're valid and they're reliable, and our practices um, are sustainable between all of us. So the fast bridge assessments that are given at K and 1 is called early reading and early math. There's seven probes that are given one-on-one, -on -one between an assessor and then the child. And then in grades two through five, they're actually adaptive assessments given on the Chromebooks. So by adaptive, I mean that a student, um, when they respond, the next question adapts to the response given by the student. So if we get the answer right, the next question's gonna be a little bit higher in difficulty, right? If they answer incorrectly, it might go down a little bit. And what that gives us is like a general performance indicator of how well the student will perform and if they're at risk or not. So all these are are screening tools. It's giving like a temperature. Okay, it's getting a dipstick of like, is there a risk? Right? Could there possibly be risk? It's not telling us there is or where it is, but there could be there. So then we have all that data, we bring it together and make it kind of digestible, and we meet at the building level committee. Now our, our um, building principals are the facilitators of these meetings. And we have a diverse representation from the building. So at Windermere, we have an L teacher, we have gen ed teachers, we have special ed teachers, we have interventionists, Mrs. Flanagan, myself. So representative of the entire building. And we look at school-wide risk levels. So we really take that like bird's eye view of Windermere. We look at grade levels, where who has the greatest risk, where the percentages are. And then we also look at like the disaggregated subpopulation, right? How are students with disabilities doing? How are English language learners doing? And then we identify where those greatest risk percentages lie. Where are we most concerned about? And then we make sure that our staffing is distributed equitably, right? So if we just said, oh, every grade level gets you know, one interventionist, use it as you wish or figure that out, it's gonna be equal, it's not gonna be equitable, right? So for example, if like our fifth grade has 12% risk, right, and our second grade has 40% risk, you wanna put, right, more staffing and interventions there to hopefully move that mark and not just equally distribute them. And then we set goals. So we say, okay, wow, second grade to 40%. We're gonna increase the time, right? We really wanna focus there. We wanna see that high risk number move from 40 to 30 at the next benchmark. And then we wanna see that low risk number to move from you know, 20 to 10. And we set goals for ourselves. So then, this is the fun part, we meet at the grade level. So this was a new practice, um, I think it's small one, it was somewhat new, definitely a new practice at Windermere, where we sat down just like this, and it's all the grade level teachers, all the special ed teachers, any ENL teacher, all of our interventionists, and then starting this winter, we'll also have our PPS staff for that other half of the triangle, that data just isn't finished yet because our teachers are learning their students. So we all sit around just like this, there's like 15 to 18 people, and we literally go kid by kid based on that fast bridge data. So we start with fast bridge as our starting point. We talk about the kid at the highest risk, and we go down. We talk about all the students at risk. And then we use multiple data sources. So like I said, fast bridge is a temperature, right, a dipstick. And then we ask our teachers, okay, what other data do you have? Does your data support this data? We actually said, like, you say, that's my kid, that's me. And then you answer a couple questions. So that's actually what brought some joy to the meetings. Everyone was goofing around, like, that's my kid, that's me. And then they share. So yeah, my data does support what you're seeing in fast grade. 
This is their F and P level, their guided reading level. I would recommend, or their area of need is really fluency. So I would recommend a fluency intervention. Probably a small group would be appropriate. And then the interventionist can chime in. And the rest of the grade level is here in this. So the feedback from these meetings is just wonderful. Like honestly, it's so positive. Like that was the most positive meeting. That was the most worthwhile meeting. I got to see what my colleagues are also doing. Right? A lot of times people go like, oh my gosh, all my kids are struggling, or I have so many struggling readers. But then they get to see the grade level as a whole and realize, oh, right, my readers aren't actually as struggling as I thought they were. So the feedback from these meetings is really, really positive. So we leave that meeting knowing which students are going to get service and what intervention they're going to get. And then because of this tier one problem that I said at the beginning, teachers walked away from these meetings this year knowing that they had students in their classroom at risk who were not going to get pulled. Right? Because we can't, we can't do it. It's not going to work. And we don't have the staffing. And they were like, we got it. Right? We got it. I'm confident that with five days of adverse instruction, this student is going to make growth. I can handle it and I'm going to monitor it. So that's what I meant by like our students. Everybody took a collective um, in helping everyone. So then after that meeting, we obviously can't wait till the winter um, to reevaluate is this working, right? How's this kid doing? So that's really on the interventionist and the classroom teacher. So the interventionist collects weekly or bi-weekly progress monitoring, and FastBridge, the tool that we use, has a component for that, and they're constantly collecting this data. So if they see, like Dr. Shanahan said, the intervention's really working, I think they're ready to go back to the classroom. They can do that. Or they might say, they're not showing the growth that we need to see in eight weeks. I think I should change the intervention. So those conversations are happening between the benchmarks with the interventionists and the classroom. So that's really our four cycle process. The benchmarking, universal screener, building level meetings, grade level meetings, progress time. So then the last thing I just want to touch on is like, so what are we doing to bridge these gaps, right? I told you in the beginning, we have a tier one problem. I just explained our intervention process, but like, so what are we really doing to bridge these gaps? So first and foremost, our tier one instruction. Right? Our teachers are crafted, they're experts at their craft. They know good, solid, quality instruction. We've purchased programs such as Phonics First to support Tier 1 instruction. And then we're also focusing on pre-assessments. So in math, for example, right, there's a scope and sequence. So if we just say, oh, second grade, they, you know, they didn't get to their last three units, and we started third grade with those last three units, it wouldn't make sense because math scaffolds on itself. So we're trying to do pre-assessments and then those just-in-time um, classroom like backfilling and interventions. So as each module or each unit comes up, our teachers are pre-assessing their students to see where are the gaps, right? Do they have the prerequisite skills they need to succeed in this unit? And if they don't, I'll intervene now, right? And in the next module, the same thing. So pre-assessments and that backfilling. Then we also have these intervention menus that we've created that are new. This summer, our reading interventionists work together to create a variety of options to meet our students' needs. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all. Yep, they're coming to academic intervention, and I have one thing I can do with them. We're really trying to target the need with the intervention. So we're working with just fluency, just number ID, just number sequencing, and really trying to target that need, like Dr. Shanahan said, so they can go back there. And then with math, in the primary level, that's a brand new position, um, thanks to the board support. So now our youngest students are getting math intervention as well. Our teaching assistants, another huge district initiative that our K-1-2 classrooms each have a teaching assistant for part of their day. They are trained in providing one-on-one -on -one interventions to our students. So the teachers have all this data, they set up a procedure and a process, and those TAs are working with these students. After school programs, we're in the process of creating some after-school programs in both reading, writing, math. Um, so we will select these students that could use more intervention or support or might be like the right fit for the program that we create that could be just enough to move them. Um, summer school. As you know, last year we had a really successful summer school program. And actually at these grade level meetings, 
some teachers were there and taught summer school, and they were like, oh, that was my student in the summer. This is the progress that they made from the end of last year till now. And that was so helpful um, to the conversation to know what went on during those six weeks. So we're hoping again next year to have a summer school. And so that would fit into this MTSS process in spring. Who do we think is a good candidate for the summer school program? That we've seen intervention after intervention after intervention either working and we gotta keep it up, right? Or not working and they might be that summer school. And then finally, we still have in place an instructional support team where when we have students who are getting tier one interventions no love not responding then tier two and tier three still not responding changing the intervention we come together with the parents with everybody that works with that student and we decide is there something else going on do we need some more testing we need we need to figure out a, really it's a collaborative problem solving meeting to find out what else can we do here to meet this student And that's all I have. So are there any questions for me? So what are the actual numbers you really like? What numbers? Per risk? Yeah. Um, they're above 20 per risk, for sure. So some grade levels are at 40, some are at 47, some are at 33. Can we get some more detail so, on that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's what dipstick is the is really the, the point of it. But yeah, we could have put it over. They're just in process right now.
Tell us where you're going to be. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Goosen. I'm going to be at the middle school. I'm teaching sixth grade science as a special education teacher. So thank you all for allowing me to be here. Great. Welcome aboard. Hi, I'm Julianne Grover. I was hired as a school counselor at the Family Support Center. I'm excited to join the team. Great. Welcome aboard. Uh, I'm Mary Els. Um, I teach uh, strings, and I'll be at Windermere and Smallwood Elementary. So I'm excited to get started. Wonderful. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Ms. Castelli, do we have any follow up action items? No. All right. We will need a motion then to go to executive session. I'll make a motion to go to executive session or appoint uh, a particular person. Okay, second. Mr. Smith, all those in favor of convening for executive session, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you everyone for coming.